but Isaiah 53, John 19, John 3, the very few chapters rank as highly wonderful as Isaiah 53. Begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of, dry, out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us, of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he, was, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in, the de in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing, good congregational singing, good choir singing, good special singing. Thank you for a good Sunday school hour. Lord, thank you for the open door for the two jail services this morning. Thank you for being a good God. Now, Father, we ask and implore upon you that, God, you'd put a hedge about this place now. We pray that you'd bind the powers of hell. And, God, we certainly pray that the sweet Holy Ghost of God would arrange the atmosphere now. And, Father, we pray that the Word of God would go forth. You'd bless the reading of it, and now you'd anoint the preaching of it. And, God, we pray for the Holy Ghost to... Uh, be able to allow to do his office work, moving in and up and down the aisles and in the pews. And God, may he arrest our hearts. May he bring unto our remembrance uh, why we're here and what it took for us to be here. And God, I pray for Holy Ghost conviction. I pray for sinners uh, to be convicted of their sin and be saved. I pray for the saints of God to be convicted. Uh, that, God, they might draw closer. I pray for revival, and I pray for the power of God uh, like we've never seen it. Uh, now, Father, use this unworthy vessel. Stir in our midst. Uh, glorify your namesake, uh, and we'll thank you for that. Uh, now, Father, help Miss Crystal. You know what she stands in need of. Help Brother Ed. Uh, Father, I pray for Miss Tammy's family. Uh, I pray for this uh, young lady that gave birth.
baby down there in Tennessee and both of them in the hospital not looking good. Uh, Father, I pray for them. Uh, Father, I pray for Miss Lexi and her upcoming surgery. You'd be with her and touch her. Uh, Father, I pray for Brother Tony and others that are sick. You'd help them. Uh, but Father, I pray especially now uh, you'd anoint the service uh, and we'll bless you for it. Use this unworthy vessel and we'll thank you for that. For it's in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we ask it all. Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to draw your attention to a couple things. First of all, I want you to notice the contempt for Jesus. Look at verse number 2. Uh, the Bible said, uh, uh, He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, uh, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Uh, all those pretty pictures you see of Jesus, that's not what he looked like. Uh, there was nothing pretty about him. There was nothing attractive about him. Uh, there was nothing that caused him to stand out. And you'd say, boy, I want to be around him. Uh, no, there was nothing that caused us to desire him. Uh, Matter of fact, spiritually, none of us desired God. Uh, we didn't seek after God. We didn't retain God in our own knowledge. Uh, we find in verse number 3, he's despised and rejected of men. Uh, he's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Uh, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Uh, he was despised, uh, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Uh, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Uh, can I say there's a portion of the world uh, that has heard the story that Jesus was crucified for their sins and they do not esteem to know anything about it. They look at him as somebody who came to die, as somebody uh, who was not in control of his own destiny and somebody uh, who is not worth looking into. But I want to tell you, friend, he's the only one worth looking to. We see the contempt for Jesus. Notice the crucifixion of Jesus in verse number 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Uh, and with his stripes we are healed. Jesus was beaten for our sins. Jesus was humiliated for our sins. Jesus was nailed on a cross and suspended between heaven and earth uh, after he'd been beaten beyond recognition. Uh, and there he bled and died for our sins. Uh, my dear friends, he came into this world to die because without his death, burial, and resurrection, there had been no hope for sinners. Amen. He made a way where you and I could be saved from our sins. We see the crucifixion of Jesus, the contempt for Jesus. Uh, notice the cause for crucifying Jesus in verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He not only died for our sins, our sins were put upon him. He became the perpetuation or the payment for our sins. Every filthy, vile sin that mankind could ever commit was committed to Jesus that day. He was crucified for our sins. Now notice the character of Jesus. I mean, they've beaten him. They've plucked out his beard. They've planted on his head a crown of thorns. They put a robe on him and mocked him. He carried his cross down the Via Della Rosa two miles. Uh, they suspended him between heaven and earth, uh, stripped him. He's there uh, uh, naked in an open shame. Uh, uh, it was so hideous, God turned out the lights and the sun refused to shine uh, while Jesus is hanging on the cross. Uh, but look at Jesus' character. Look at verse 7. He was oppressed... And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Do you know Jesus could have called for the angels to come and deliver him off the cross? Amen. You know, Jesus didn't even need the angels. He could have told those nails to leave his hands and feet, and they would have. Can I say this? Jesus could have healed his own body where he looked like he looked before they beat him. But see, if he'd done any of that, there'd been no hope for us. The character of Jesus is the character of God. He came to die for our sins, uh, and he opened not his mouth. Uh, he took what he needed to take that he could take you and I to heaven, and we could be restored to God one day. Can I say, notice the condemnation of Jesus. Look at verse number 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment 
And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Can I say? He did nothing wrong. He was sinless. Yet he was imprisoned. He was judged at a kangaroo court, probably like some of these liberal judges today. Amen. Uh, judging for filthy lucre. Can I say this? Even the judge couldn't condemn him, said, I find no fault in him. Yet they crucified him anyway. Because they hated him. Because he was righteous. You say, why? Was he condemned, preacher, if he was sinless? Because he had the sin of mankind imputed unto him. And when sin was imputed unto him, he had to pay sin's wages. For the wages of sin is death. And he died for your sin and my sin. What condemned him? Our sin condemned the Son of God. And then I want you to notice the crowning of Jesus. Verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Uh, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Uh, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. Uh, he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, uh, and made intercession for the transgressors. What is the crowning of Jesus? You and I that are saved. Amen. That was the joy that was set before him. Jesus didn't come to build a kingdom. He came to save sinners. And what is the jewels in his crown? No more than you and I that have put our faith and trust in him. I'm interested in verse number 10 today. Verse number 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Did you ever wonder what pleases God? Now we can see all that God has created and designed and there are things that please us. My wife and I love looking at waterfalls. That's pleasing. We love seeing sunsets over the ocean. That's pleasing. Huh? Some of us, flowers are pleasing. Some of us, butterflies and nature is pleasing. There are things that God has done that pleases us. What do you think it takes to please God? I mean, God flung the stars out there on nothing and called them by name. We get telescopes to look at stars. God say, no big deal. Hmm? Rainbow, no big deal. Sunsets, no big deal. What does it take to please? God. And for just a few minutes this morning, I want to preach on what pleases the Lord. Can I say, first of all, the Lord is pleased with His Son. We find in verse number 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise Him. Who? His Son. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, He was pleased with Jesus uh, and what Jesus did uh, for creation. Uh, the Bible says in John chapter number 1, uh, verse number 1, in the beginning was the Word, uh, Jesus, uh, and the Word was with God, uh, Jesus and God, uh, and the Word was God, Jesus is God. Uh, uh, the same was in the beginning with God. Uh, all things were made by Him. Who? Jesus. Uh, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Uh, uh, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 uh, that when God saw what it was made, uh, it was pleasing unto Him. Uh, God was pleased with what Jesus, His Son, uh, did in creation. Uh, everything Christ made, God was pleased with. What a blessing uh, that the Godhead not only uh, participated in creation, uh, but was pleased with creation. Huh? Can I say he was pleased with the Son of creation? He was pleased with the Son in his commitment. Long before God made man out of the dust of the earth, God knew he's going to have to die for man. Somewhere back in eternity past, uh, 
There was a business meeting between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Uh, and they uh, uh, determined what they were going to do uh, in the preterminate council of Almighty God. Uh, and Christ in that meeting said, I'll pay their sin debt. Amen. And then we know he's born of a virgin. He lived a sinless, perfect life. One writer said Christ just coming into this sin-cursed world would be like us uh, running through a briar patch with no clothing on. Uh, everywhere he was, sin was pricking at him, and sin was there. Uh, even though he didn't sin, uh, 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 he was tempted by sin at all points like us, yet he was without sin. But he was committed to pay our sin debt. Philippians says this in chapter 2 and verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation uh, and took upon him the form of a servant uh, and he was made in the likeness of men uh, and being found fashioned as a man uh, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Amen. It pleased God with the commitment of Christ that he became a servant and he was obedient unto death even the death of the cross. You know what pleases the Lord? when his children are servants and obedient. Can I say it pleased the Lord uh, with his son's conquering. He conquered defilement or sin. And you and I, we can't stop sinning. We have filthy habits until we meet Jesus. And Jesus can break the bondage of our sin. Why? Because he's done defeated sin. Hmm? What a blessing. Things we can't do, it's no problem for him. All we've got to do is learn to yield to him, learn to look to him, learn to trust him, uh, and he'll break the bondage of sin. Uh, he not only conquered defilement, he conquered death. Uh, Oh, death, where's thy sting? Oh, grave, where's thy victory? Uh, hey, here in a few weeks we'll celebrate Easter that he got up, uh, up from the grave. I've got news for you. Every Sunday we celebrate he's not in the get grave. Uh, we worship a risen Savior. Uh, and because he conquered death, death has no dominion over you and I. Uh, hey, uh, child of God, uh, uh, death has no uh, hold on you. Uh, uh, to die in the Lord is to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord. Uh, what a blessing. He conquered death. He conquered devilment or sin, but he also conquered the devil. Uh, the devil tried to kill him in the garden. He couldn't. The devil tried to kill him uh, uh, when he tempted him in, in the wilderness. He couldn't. The devil, the devil, the devil, but the devil couldn't, couldn't, couldn't. Huh? And one of these days he's going to throw that sorry no good serpent out in the lake of fire where it'll burn forever and ever. Uh, you and I are no match for the devil, but we know the one who defeats him. Uh, can I say Hebrews chapter 2 gives us some insight on the conquering of the Lord. Verse number 9, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the gr grace of God, should taste death for every man. Never forget that. There are some that say only certain people can be saved. No, Jesus tasted death for every man. Jesus interested in saving every man. Huh? Can I say this? Uh, in verse 10 it says, For it became him uh, for whom are all things, uh, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, uh, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Uh, in verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 2 it says, For as much then as the children uh, are partakers uh, of flesh and blood, uh, he also himself likewise took part of the same, uh, that through death he might destroy him uh, that had the power of death, that is the devil, uh, and deliver them who through fear of death uh, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Uh, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, uh, but, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Uh, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be like unto his brethren, uh, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things per pertaining to God uh, to make uh, reconciliation 
person for the sins of the people. Uh, you say, what's he saying, preacher? Uh, I'm saying he conquered the devil. Uh, he conquered death. Uh, he conquered sin. Uh, he became like us uh, that one day we can become like him uh, and can be reconciled back to God. Uh, I say Christ, his son, pleased him. Uh, can I say this? He pleased God in the, con in, in the consequences, the results, the outcome. Can I say Jesus died for the joy that was set before him and God's pleased with the outcome. What is the outcome? It was predestined of God that every man would be saved in Jesus Christ. I didn't say it was predestinated for people to be saved. It was predestinated that those that would get saved would get saved because of Christ. And that pleases God for all those that trust in Him. Hmm? Uh, listen, if you're here today and you're saved, you're not of the rudiments of the world. Now, the world don't know who you are, but you're a child of God. You are citizens of the heavenly country. Huh? What a blessing. What a blessing to be accepted among the beloved. What a blessing to be able to come to the house of God amongst our kind and be able to worship and fellowship. Isn't a blessing uh, uh, we get to come and hear truth, not the lies of the world or the devil. We get to come and our souls get fed, our spirits get lifted. We get to come uh, and worship the one who's worthy of our praise. Regardless of what we go through, we can still worship him because he's worthy. God was pleased with him in his, his consequence. God was pleased with him in the culmination. What happened to Christ afterwards? Psalms 8, 6. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Philippians 2, 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, giving him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every name should bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. What are you saying? I'm saying everybody's going to confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. They're either going to confess it by believing on him in this life or at the judgment they're going to bow before him and profess that before they're sentenced to their eternity without him. It's better to bow before him now instead of waiting and having to bow before him then. I'm wondering what pleases the Lord. His son pleases him. You know what else pleases the Lord? The salvation of sinners pleases the Lord. Ah. Uh, in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord's not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Can I tell you today that it's God's will for every sinner to be saved? Jesus tastes the death for every man, and Jesus gives an invitation to every man, whosoever will, let him come. And if you come to Jesus, He'll change your life. And it pleases God when sinners are saved. Say, so what is that all about? A sinner is headed this direction, uh, but realizes he's lost and that direction doesn't end good. Uh, and he turns from his sin in his life, uh, and he turns to the Lord, uh, and he asks the Lord to save him. Uh, and God not only saves him, uh, he does exactly what that song Miss Tammy and Brother Thad sang about. Uh, he takes that person's sins away. Uh, he robes them in his righteousness. Uh, he makes them a child of God, a citizen of heaven uh, all because he's willing to put their faith in him uh, and when sinners turn from their sin uh, and turn to the Savior uh, it pleases God my dear friends uh, think about it this way people that aren't saved blaspheme and cuss God but when they turn to God and believe on him they start praising God uh, you think that doesn't please God when somebody goes from a blasphemer to a blesser that pleases God, huh? Amen. Can I say this? Uh, Luke 19, 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why Jesus come. He come for you, and he came for me. Luke 15, 10 says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, I love that verse, but it's misquoted a lot. A lot of people say the angels rejoice when sinners repent. That's not what that Bible says. That Bible says there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Yeah. The angels are present 
But they're not doing the rejoicing. Who's rejoicing? The Lord's rejoicing. uh, And those saints that have gone on before us are rejoicing uh, because one more is added to the family. What a blessing. Hmm? Angels look in unawares. They don't know what's going on. Only those that have been redeemed. And the Redeemer knows what's going on. God's pleased with the salvation of sinners. He's pleased with His Son, but He's also pleased with His saints' obedience. When we do right, it pleases God. Now listen, I've, I've raised three children. Well, let me rephrase that. Miss Nett's raised three children and let me go wrong for the ride. Uh, it was always a blessing when you didn't have to tell them 20 times to do something. And let me just say this. Ask them. I never told them 20 times. We didn't get that far. I couldn't even count one, two, three. A lot of times it's one and a half. Huh? But when you ask them to do something and you didn't have to threaten them, that's a blessing. That's pleasing. As a matter of fact, they might have got a little McDonald's out of that deal. Huh? Well, the Bible says if we know how to give good gifts to our children and we know how to correct our children, don't you think God knows how to give good gifts to His children? He also knows how to chasten His children. But one thing that blesses God is when He don't have to chasten them, when they're obedient. Can I say the Bible says this in 1 Samuel 15, 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Can I say it's one thing to get all dressed up and come to church, and it's one thing to uh, uh, sing the songs in the congregational, and it's one thing to, uh, uh, you know, do all this. But if God speaks to your heart and you don't do what God says, it's all t- sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. It don't mean anything. You know, it's one thing to sacrifice to come. It's another thing to obey when God speaks to your heart. And not only when you're here, when you're driving down the road and the Lord tells you to turn off the radio because He wants to talk with you. And you turn it off and you talk with the Lord. God's pleased with that. When God tells you to call somebody, invite them to church, and you do it, God's pleased with that. When God tells you to give somebody a track and you do, God's pleased with that. When God, any time He tells you something and you do it, He's pleased. He loves obedience. Hmm? Can I say this? He wants us to be obedient to His commands, the Word of God. He's given us how to live. And when we live like God says, it pleases Him. Hmm? You can ask my kids. I used to take them to the mall and point out some of the freaks walking around there. I said, you ever come home like that? It's not going to be a good day for you. I told them, we're fosters. We don't look that way. Can I say something? We carry the Lord's name. We call ourselves Christian. There's certain things we ought to do and certain things we ought not to do. The Bible spells it out. We're going to carry His name. We ought to do what He says. Hmm. You said, you must have been a rough daddy. Yeah, I was real rough. They got everything they ever wanted, huh? Spoiled them to death. Why? Because I loved them. But there was just some stipulations that we just didn't mess with at our house. Yeah, and they're so warped. All three of them be at dinner today, huh? Can I say this? Not only be it to his commands, we need to be obedient to his commission. We heard that for three nights this week. Huh? The last command Jesus gave before he went to glory is he told us to take the gospel to every creature. Jesus saved us, but that wasn't the end of it. If that was the case, he'd just take us to heaven. He saved us to be a light and salt to other people in this world. Could I say, there are people in this world that have problems. And I'm not just talking about sin problems. Just think about what you're going through, through with your mama. I mean, I'm always so thrilled to see you because I know you got the way of the world on you. Just think if you weren't saved. And think how many people out there are in the same ship you're in, but they aren't saved. They got problems. Hmm? Her mama's got dementia real bad. They got to really keep a close eye on her. I mean, she leaves the house and, you know, she just, she don't know any better. 
Miss Melissa's went from being the child to now being the caretaker, being the parent. Hmm. But her mama don't understand. It's hard. And it's hard for Miss Melissa to get somebody to watch so she can get to come to church. Uh, there's a lot of people there in the same situation. What do you think about people that are in here today that suffer from some depression? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I want to tell you something. You live in this world, and you listen to this world, and you look around this world, anybody can be depressed. Amen. Depression's a real thing. I know some preachers that want to just shrug it off. You know why? Because they're idiots. Depression's real. There are people that suffer with it. But you're here today, and you're saved. You may have depression, and I know there are preachers like, well, if you're saved, bless God, you ought to let the Holy Ghost, blah, 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 blah. You're still depressed. Sometimes it's a chemical imbalance. It has nothing to do with you and your character. There's a difference between clinical depression and just getting down because it's a rainy day. What do you think about people that are unsaved? They're depressed. There's some people that suffer with anxiety. I get real anxious anymore. Anytime around chocolate or traffic. Uh, but mine's not a chemical. There are some people that really have panic attacks and have face anxiety and face it's tough for them to be around people and it's tough and God has saved folks like that. There may be somebody like that here today. And it's tough for you, but you're saved. Think about people out there that aren't saved. Amen. So what does God want us to do? Marcy, God wants us to show them in what state we are and what we face and what we suffer with, but Jesus still saved us and changed our life. And He manages all that rather than us trying to handle it all. Mm -mm. What greater light then you can be to somebody suffering like what you're suffering and say, yeah, I'm going through it. I understand. Well, what helps you? Well, Jesus helps me. Hmm? Uh, what helps you? And I don't know if you're depressed, but if you're depressed and you're down, what helps you get through it? What helps you get through your anxiety? How, what medications? Uh, well, medication can do some things. Well, let me help you. One that helps me, his name is Jesus. Uh, Amen. See, God didn't save us to make perfect people out of us. He saved us in spite of our sin, in spite of our condition, in spite of our DNA. He saved us uh, to change us uh, so we could show others, regardless of what you're going through, Christ can help you. But Doug told me something on the way in. I thought it was great. Churches are, are, are to be a hospital not a courtroom. Might help some of you. So what are we to do? We're to let patients know where they can get the help. I preached one time on God's spiritual hospital. When he said, I thought about that message. It was the only time I ever preached it was here. Uh, hey, you got to have a nursery. got babies, newborn babes. Got to have a place for them. Uh Got to have a surgical room for those that have very dire cases. Uh, you got to have a room where folks just need to, some antibiotics, need to pick me up. And all, I mean, you got all kinds of different wards in the hospital. huh? Well, that's what the church is to be. When people come in here, they need help. huh? And aren't you glad we don't have to ask them what kind of insurance they have? We already got one that paid it all. I say he's pleased when we're obedient to the commission the commission is to go to people like us and tell them where they the help we got Amen. his name is Jesus and once they get help we got to teach them how he helps them can I say living for Christ is a damn thing why do you think Paul said he died daily? You've got to die out to self every day or else self will take control. Can I say he's pleased when his saints are obedient to church? Why? Because that's where we get help. 
I love the church. Jesus loved it and gave himself for it. Amen. You all know, you, you say the same thing. Our best friends in the world are in this building. Amen. Hmm? Amen. Uh, we serve the same God. We think a lot alike. We have the same goals. We, we, just, we got the same spirit. We just enjoy spending time with each other. How many of you have a family member at the family reunions you can't stand? Sure. Amen. People are going like this. Cameras on. Uh, they don't know. Everybody, everybody's got a cousin Eddie that we laugh at. Well, then we got that cousin that oh, I can't stand that guy. He's on my nerves. Huh? You got that cousin knows everything but doesn't know anything. Huh? Yeah. Aren't you glad you can come to this family? <laughs> we just love being around one another. And even when we got a cousin Eddie or that other cousin, we still love them. It's an amazing thing. So how'd that happen? The Lord. Yep. Right. Hmm. Huh? Listen, it's often been said that God's not looking for your abilities. He's looking for your availability. You ever heard that? But, but listen, I, I, I read this this week. I thought this was good. We wrestle that we don't have what it takes to be effective for God and please God. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like I'm never good enough to please God? Do you ever feel like I, I can't be this person or that person or do this or do that? I used to be that way. Hear somebody preach, I tell them, boy, I wish I could preach like that. Hear somebody else preach, I boy, I wish I could preach like that. Hear somebody else preach, man, I wish I could. She finally said, well, you shut up. He said, you preach, look at all the people come here, you preach. They love to hear you preach. Quit worrying about what somebody else did. I don't know if it's the Lord or Miss Nett, but somebody help me with that, all right? But listen, we get this mindset that we're not good enough, or we can't do this, or we can't do that. Listen, you can be very effective. You know, it takes zero talent to do the things I'm about ready to tell you. Zero talent. I don't want to point out who qualifies for that, but there's a couple of you don't have any talent. You, you qualify, okay? Listen, it takes zero talent to be on time. Hmm? Take zero talent to be prepared. You know, when I was in school, I hated that person when class started. They already had their pencils out and their eraser and, and their pad of paper. Kids Google pencils and erasers. I know you don't know what those things are, but I hated that person. I always had her pencil sharpened and all that, and I'm thinking, nerd. That's what I always thought. We didn't call them nerds in our day. We called them dorks. Uh, you know, but you don't have to have any talent to be prepared. Can I say this? You don't have to have any talent to have a proper attitude. Thank the Lord for folks that come to church with a proper attitude. Hmm? Uh, some don't, Brother Tommy, but everybody else pretty good. Uh, it takes zero talent to have compassion for somebody else. Because without the grace of God, you could be going something through something worse than them. Can I say it takes zero talent to be teachable? You know, it's a whole lot better when you're around somebody if they're teachable and you're trying to teach them. If you're on a job and it's your job to train them, if they're not trainable, you're just beating your head up against the wall. Huh? What can I say is, as children of God, God would teach us a whole lot more things if we just be teachable. And you don't need any talent to be teachable. All you got to do is be ready. Hmm? And can I say this? It takes zero talent to have good ethics, have good effort, and just do a little extra. You know, if we'd all do a little extra, we'd get a lot more done for God. Huh? Listen, by exercising zero talent, God will produce tremendous results. Hmm? And you don't need any talent to do those things. I'm about done. I preach a lot longer than I thought I would. God is pleased when the sanctuary is full. So how do you know that? Luke 14, 23, And the Lord said unto his servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. You know why God wants to fill a house? So bubbling over and running into the saucer. Say, so what's that mean? That means when the house is full, it's time to do something. You send out something, plant another church, or you build another church and fill it up. 
But it pleases God when the sanctuary is full. That means somebody's been doing something. And then lastly, it pleases God to send a fire. Can I say everywhere in the Scripture where God sends spiritual confirming fire, it's because certain conditions have been met. Most of the time they finish the work. It's because prayer's been made, Solomon, Elijah on Mount Carmel. And can I say God's pleased and He wants to confirm His satisfaction by sending the fire. You know what this world needs to see? The fire of God sent to the church of God. And they'll want to come and see what in the world's going on. A lot of churches are dead and dry, cold, unfriendly, uncaring, judgmental. Who wants to go to that mess? Huh? You know, next week's a wonderful week. Miss Annette and I will celebrate 35 years of marriage. On the same day, I'll celebrate 50 years of being saved. In 50 years, can I say this? I've never, ever once been drawn to a cold, dead, judgmental church. Not my cup of tea. I want to be where it's alive, where something's happening, where people are getting help. Can I say that's what the ministry's about, getting help. And the Lord is pleased to help people. I preached not long ago. On issues, issues, everybody's got issues. But the Lord can help us with our issues. Now, I don't know what you need today, but I know the answer. His name is Jesus. And the Lord would be real pleased to help you today. But to get help, you've got to ask Jesus for help. We're going to have an invitation, invite you to come. Some of you may want to come talk to Jesus. You may be here and you don't know Jesus. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus. It'll change your life. You'll find out what true love is. You'll find out what true joy is, what true satisfaction is. You'll find all that out. But most importantly, you'll be pleased in the outcome because, oh, what he does for you not only affects you now, but for all of eternity. But it also pleases God. How many of us wouldn't want to please God? Every child wants to please his parents. We ought to please our Heavenly Father. Maybe you're here today and you're not saved. You come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you how to be saved. It's real simple to be saved. You just got to realize you need to be saved and be willing to come and believe on the Lord. For whosoever believeth on the Lord shall be saved. Can I say, maybe you're here today and you're saved, but you just don't feel like you've been pleasing God. Why don't you come talk to him about it? You know what that, that'll do? That'll cause you to please Him. Listen, we always try to have an open line of communication with our children. Anything going on, you can always come talk to us. Can I say anything going on in your life, you can always talk to God. He cares for you, friend, and it pleases God when you trust Him enough to talk to Him. Maybe you've got a burden for somebody that needs to be saved. You need to come talk to the Lord and pray. Maybe you need to pray about something else. What a blessing that God hears and answers prayer. So let's all stand, Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While they come to pick out a song, let me ask you a question. Are you pleasing the Lord? You can. You can. Why don't, if you don't know, ask Him, Lord, am I pleasing you? Some are already coming. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for Isaiah 53 and showing that you died for our sin. Lord, there may be somebody here today that's never trusted in Christ. I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, there may be somebody here today that's saved, but Lord, their life hasn't been pleasing unto you. Lord, you've troubled them about that. Maybe they'll come. Talk to you and get that made right. Lord, there may be somebody here today that is really, really up against it. They're really struggling. There's an area of their life that, Lord, they can't just get a handle on. Lord, I pray you'd help them. I pray they'd just surrender it to you fully. And, God, you would help them. It would please them and please you. And then, God, if somebody else has another need, whatever it is, God, speak to hearts. Help folks today. Lord, we want everybody to leave pleasing the Lord. And, Lord, we'll thank you for what you do. For it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray.
Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.